we we built our business by training apprentices. We never hired ex we never hired hairdressers with a book. Um, so we would train these guys, and I was pretty busy. My wife was busy, and we would we would train people until they were good enough to get a chair. I did basically I followed the formula that the access location I worked at um, had sort of created, and I just tried to fix some of the bugs. You know, I maybe yeah. I made training a little harder, a little longer. So I gotta ask how. How did you make the transition from one salon to a few locations? Because I see so many, so many salons that are like cool salons. You know, they could they could be an entire franchise, but you know something's not clicking there. It's a really really good question. Um, by the time we had done our first salon was full. We had no chairs, um, and uh, you know it was it was totally packed. We we're making a reasonable living. So it seemed like the the natural thing was to open a second one. So we opened a second one, and it, we were going to position. I was really, really following a lot of um, Van Council's ideas, and he had just opened a new talent salon. So I thought, you know what? I've got all these trainees. At this point, we probably had 10 apprentices um, for the 10 stylists because, as anybody knows who's been in the industry, you overhire because you know that half of them are never going to make it. So we were constant. We never stopped hiring people. We were never not hiring, and it's like a machine gun approach. Every every once in a while, one of them hits, and uh, so we opened this second location once these guys were all ready to go, and it bombed. It didn't do well at all, and so it was six months, and it was bleeding money, and uh, the guy across the street from my my big static location, the one that was doing really really well, yeah, he um I think he. Like, you know what, a super, super talented guy, and I don't think this will come back to bite me in the ass, but basically he put everything up his nose. And he had a, this beautiful salon. He had, he had gone to incredible lengths to build this salon. There wasn't a single thing that wasn't custom made. The tile work, this is caramel, Russell. Um, yes, yes, that's a beautiful space. It's beautiful. So floor. Nice. He built yeah. it. Yeah. And he, one day, I used to determine my own success by based on um, if my lights were on after his, because he was directly across the street from me. Right. So if his lights went off before ours did, we would go, okay, well, we're dead, but at least he's deader than we are. you know. <laughs> and his salon was full of like super cool hairdressers. Right. Like they were total dicks. And they were dressed like total crazy. There'd be guys like in sort of dresses and, you know, weird, crazy mohawks down to the floor. It was, it was like one of these salons that's really intimidating. And um, the customer service aspect of it wasn't necessarily maybe what their focus was. Whereas right. for us, we were like, you know, those guys are probably way better hairdressers than ours, but we're going to, you know, we're going to treat our clients like absolute gold. That was always our thing. Um, you know, we're pretty good at what we do and we don't do crazy shit and we'll, we'll do our best to never screw up. You know, we, we may not rock the world with the world's greatest haircut, but we had built it on stability and, and consistency. That's how we had built our brand, where those guys were super creative and artistic. And, uh, and what ended up happening, one day their lights went on off and they never came back on. And so I had this one location that was bleeding. I had a friend who, told, who contacted me right away and said, did you hear about X salon? Um, the, they've closed the door and whatever. Um, that night somebody smashed the windows. It was probably a disgruntled employee because apparently the guy had like taken all their paychecks and not paid them for a month. Ooh. And so my immediate thing was um, I started con I, I hunted the landlord down for that location and I uh, I ended up paying the guys back rent and it took me about two months but I brokered the deal paid the, all of the guys back rent and debts to the landlord and took over that space and closed the one that was dying um, nice. and it cost me it cost me tens of thousands of dollars to get out of it because I had to sit I was paying a ton of rent and uh, and it was the best move we ever made. Now, the thing that we did, though, with this location, to, to fully go back and answer your question, Damien, I'm sorry, I got a little bit long-winded, but um, we decided we were debating on whether to call it static because we had static on both sides of the street. We're going to go static east, static west, or something like that. And it didn't make sense, and this salon wasn't a static. So I had been in Las Vegas the year earlier, and I'd seen a bar called Caramel at uh, Bellagio. And I thought, if I ever open another salon, it's going to be called Caramel. And that salon, when we walked in, it was Caramel. So we opened Caramel, and the name just... I think the name was what, what made it happen. And it blew up. 
And the the very first year, we I think we came second place in top salons in in by viewers or by um, the public in Vancouver. In the second year, and we'd already been in business with Static for like five or six years at that point. So it, I think the name just hit. 